I'm just gonna share a cool, cool sort of passion project that I worked on over the summer, which combines uh, an interest I have in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which I'm sure many people can relate to, uh, and also the Wolfram language. So I did a bit of multi-paradigm data science on some of the Marvel TV shows released, and uh, I found some interesting things out. So I just like to take some time to share that with you all today. Before I get into the weeds, uh, I'll just share a little bit about myself too. So I'm currently a high school senior and I'm an intern at Wolfram Research doing some things uh, related to computational chemistry a bit. My driving intellectual interests are in applied mathematics and especially how that intersects intelligent and emergent systems. So some things I'm passionate about on the side include synthetic biology uh, and AI advocacy. I like to hold workshops in my local community for those sorts of things. I also dabble in machine learning research. Um, I'm quite the functional programming zealot. One cool thing I did last, last month was host uh, the world's first functional programming conference for high schoolers. Um, and I love dystopian literature and all things tennis. So that's me and about five bullet points. With that said, uh, let's get into things. So I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Marvel Studios. Right here, I've listed the eight Marvel TV series that are released on Disney+, Plus, which is the Disney streaming platform. So for most of its life, Marvel Studios just produced movies. Um, recently, I think in January 2021, so almost two years ago now, they started releasing TV serials as well. And these are the eight ones that have been released so far. And so because I'm quite a diehard Marvel fan, I've obviously watched all of these. Some of them have uh, fared better than others, but because they're TV shows, they've taken experimental styles that deviate a bit from the formula used in Marvel movies. For example, some of them are animated, some of them in include sort of animated components in them. Uh, and recently over the summer, Miss Marvel, which was the seventh TV show to be released, um, it was released and there seemed to be a very sort of polarized opinion about it. One thing in particular is that it was the first show to be accused of review bombing. So just pasted some uh, news articles, headlines here. And because I was interested in the show, I ended up reading these articles and the statistical proof they provided for the show being review bombed was not very, um, not very strong. Basically, it just showed very low scores and equated that to review bombing. Obviously, that's a bit problematic because it may just be that a lot of people didn't like the show, not that the show was review bombed. To sort of get more information on that, we have to look at the distributions of scores and how the scores uh, are compared between multiple shows. Obviously, that doesn't necessarily make for the nicest headlines, so nobody really did that. But I was wondering if we could use the Wolfram language to maybe scrape data on online sentiment uh, for each of these TV shows and see if there are any interesting correlations in that data. So this was initially just a random question that I sat down and spent a few minutes coding up and then it led somewhere interesting. So I ended up spending almost the whole summer sort of trying to refine my approach and the questions I was asking. Uh, and to be clear, review bombing is not a very well-defined term. Uh, essentially, it means something like groups of individuals trying to purposefully harm the rating of the show. So we will just refer to review bombing as any sort of statistical sign which might suggest that this is happening. But there are obviously a lot of complications in this. We can't account for things like users' intent. And obviously, all not all negative reviews are going to be review bombed. Many of those may just be because the show is bad or something like that. So that's something to keep in mind. And I'll keep trying to bring up that nuance throughout the presentation, just to remind you that statistical evidence alone is not enough to make these sorts of conclusions. So the first thing I did was look for where I might be able to get this data from. And there are a bunch of shows, uh, sites to review TV shows like Rotten Tomatoes, IMDb, and eventually settled on using Metacritic. It doesn't have as many reviews um, for any of the shows as those other two sites I mentioned, because it tends to be a smaller site in general. But the one advantage it does have it does is that it has a nice, very regular structure. So from the perspective of someone who is trying to scrape the website, there are a bunch of patterns I can exploit to easily sort of categorize the information, which just doesn't exist for Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb. So I made the decision to sort of sacrifice that larger sample size so that I could actually uh, scrape the data much e more easily. And so when we scrape the data, uh, we find two things. First of all, each show is reviewed both by critics and what Metacritic calls users. So users are just the average viewer like you and me. And a critic is going to be a professional movie or TV show reviewer who reviews shows for a living and um, is professionally having an occupation as uh, a reviewer. So we can plot how many reviews exist for each show. 
And here the purple bars indicate how many reviews for that show was given by a critic versus how many shows were, how many reviews were given by users. Um, and so this data doesn't tend to be terribly interesting on its own. It's just sort of a first look at the data for, for um, Metacritic. And we noticed that there are many, many more user reviews than critic reviews, which makes sense because many more viewers are gonna watch a show than critics. So um, these blue columns are a lot higher. So that sort of fits with our intuition. Something that also fits with our intuition is that these purple bars are roughly constant in time. We can see that the blue bars tend to change quite dramatically um, supposedly based on how engaging that show was. How much did it engage users? Well, if it engaged it, users more, whether that was positive or negative engagement, there tended to be more reviews, like these two columns over here. Uh, other shows did not engage users quite as much, but critics are constant in time, right? Because this is their profession. And so relatively the same amount of critics are going to review each show. The last thing that we can notice which is kind of interesting is that starting from the first show, we start decreasing in user reviews, which indicates a decrease in uh, user engagement with the show. And then we start increasing again. So we have this sort of V shape in the data. And this is roughly um, in line with how, how well each show has done in terms of things like news coverage and stuff like that. So all of this pretty much makes sense. One more interesting thing we can do though is actually plot these as pie charts and ask the question, what percentage of the total reviews is made up by users versus critics? So here I've plotted that for all eight shows and we see that users tend to take up around 80% of the pie in most cases. And some of the shows that were less engaging, this dwindles down to 60 or 70%. These last two shows, Miss Marvel and She-Hulk actually have the greatest percentage of user reviews. And so we can think of this as a rough heuristic of how, like I said, impactful or provocative or engaging the show was, whether that is a positive or negative engagement. Uh, and this sort of does tend to make sense as Miss Marvel and She-Hulk are arguably the two most contentious shows Marvel has released so far in terms of people's opinions on them. The one, like I mentioned earlier, I chose to focus on mostly was Miss Marvel, but I'll sort of bring in She-Hulk a bit and talk about whether it may or may not be a candidate for review bombing as well. So that was just sort of preliminary look at the data. To sort of understand if something is being review bombed, we need to see what are reviewers and critics actually saying about it. So we can look at their reviews and see what was the average score when we take all the reviews and take the score and just average them all together. So the reviews, I should be clear, consist of a score and then written text. I'm just gonna focus mostly on the scores and their distributions here. So critics are able to rate a given show from zero to 100. So they have many degrees of freedom to rate that show. And if we plot them out, we notice that Miss Marvel is actually uh, first with a score around 77.5. WandaVision is very close, um, just a tenth of a percentage point lower. And then from there, things start to decrease a bit more dramatically down to She-Hulk, which is about at 66% uh, for its score. So these are actually pretty tightly clustered. It's a range of around 10 percentage points. And Miss Marvel and WandaVision are the clear leaders of this pack. She-Hulk is the clear sort of um, lagging show in this pack, but it's mostly well-defined. And this is for critics. If we change perspective and look at users, we notice some interesting things that we might not expect. First of all, the two shows that we're leading uh, in terms of critics, Miss Marvel and WandaVision are no longer the first two shows. WandaVision is still um, the third show, so it didn't move too much, but Miss Marvel gets bumped all the way down to second to last place. So it moved a lot, actually the most of all shows. Uh, I should be clear as well that users can only rate a show from zero to 10 percentage points. So obviously there's gonna be more variance in where things end up, given that they have fewer degrees of freedom to uh, play around with. But in general, it is a bit surprising that Miss Marvel got bumped all the way down to second to last. Uh, it's probably not what we would have expected without looking at this um, data specifically. The only instance of a show where uh, users and critics actually agree perfectly is She-Hulk, which remains in last place um, in both critics and users' opinion. Obviously, it is bumped down quite a bit compared to everything else, which is perhaps a little interesting and, again, is why people have said things that it might be review bombed as well. But we do have to admit that users and critics are essentially thinking of it in the same way. The problem with this though, is that we're just looking at the average scores. So we don't know where those scores are concentrated. And that's why it's actually a good idea to look at the distributions of scores as well. So here I have a plot where I have a, a grid and each show is a different box or a super box, if you will. 
And on the left, we see the score score distribution for users as histograms. And on the right, we see them as smooth histograms. For visualization and comparing purposes, it's easier to use uh, the right charts, I think, the smooth histograms, because the bins for these histograms don't always tend to be the same size. If we look at these uh, first four shows here, one thing we'll notice is that the distributions for critics and users don't tend to vary too much. Obviously, they're not perfectly the same, and in many cases, they don't look quite the same at all. For example, if you look at Falcon and the Winter Soldier here, but the peaks are in relatively the same spot when we compare these distributions. So they're not too outlandish. What we're seeing essentially is that though critics and users may disagree on specific instances, they roughly think of the shows in the same way. The two shows where this is not as much the case are Miss Marvel and She-Hulk, but they are actually very different in why they deviate uh, from what is the status quo. They deviate in two very different ways. So it's important to highlight that. If we look at the smooth histogram for Ms. Marvel's critic distribution, these are the distribution of the scores critics assigned to the show. We see something that is super irregular compared to the other distributions we see. And that's because Ms. Marvel uh, has a very high concentration of positive scores around the 60 to 80 range and nothing below that. So we only have these two smaller blips that indicate low scores from critics. It has an extremely high proportion of its scores concentrated in um, the higher range by critics which is a reason why it is at the front of the pack because critics tend to think of the, sh the show very highly. Uh, She-Hulk's critic distribution isn't too interesting. It's like most of the others, though a little lagging again because it's at the end. What is most interesting is when we compare the user smooth histogram with the critic smooth histogram. So in the case of Miss Marvel, they don't look anything alike at all. In fact, we notice that where one peaks, the other sort of dips. In Miss Marvel's uh, user distribution, its smooth histogram is bimodal. We see these two different peaks, which means one group of users is moving towards the left-hand side or low scores, and one group is moving to the right-hand side or high scores. So this is some indication that we have a polarized population when it comes to the show. And we also know that the negative group is slightly larger than the positive group. It has a higher peak. So this is the interesting thing that we see with Miss Marvel that we don't see in any of the other shows. Because when looking at She-Hulk, we see that essentially all the weight is on the negative side for users. So users judged it much, much more harshly than critics, but they all seem to agree with uh, this is not really enough for us to call a peak. So it may just be that it was completely weighted by uh, one group of users, but compared to Ms. Marvel, we don't see as much polarization. And that polarization is what makes raising the question of review bombing more interesting because we see there is competition within Ms. Marvel's user uh, score distribution. And we can visualize this a bit more clearly too by using distribution charts instead of smooth histograms. So these are all showing the same thing. It's just um, to see it in different formats in case one resonates uh, more clearly than the other. But this is basically the same as the smooth histogram just turned on its side for all eight of our shows. And these mostly look the same. The one thing that stands out again is Miss Marvel. It is very well rated by critics. So we can be certain that it really is the best show in critic size. One interesting thing as well is that when we look at how the individual scores are distributed, we see that Miss Marvel scores are really weighed down by this one low score. Whereas other shows, they have scores that span the gamut of all possible scores. And they may be rated as highly as Miss Marvel, for example, WandaVision and Ms. Marvel end up having the same median score, but that is because they have um, many more scores rated highly, canceling out with more scores rating lowly, as opposed to just a bunch of scores that are very well uh, reviewed. So that's another interesting thing to sort of take away from this data. And this is for critics again. And so we can see the same thing for users as well. Again, this is basically the same data, but I think there is something interesting to be seen from looking at the distribution charts. So this bulge in the distribution chart is where most of the scores are concentrated. So for these shows, the bulge is at the top, meaning most scores are concentrated in the positive score area. And so we see that for the critics, these are more um, located in a middle area and they've moved up compared to the user ratings. So users tend to think better of most shows than critics, which does track critics are usually known for being more fastidious about how they're gonna review a given show. The two shows for which is not true is Miss Marvel and She-Hulk, these last two things over here. Again, Miss Marvel, we see the same polarization where that bulge, instead of moving completely upward or completely downward, it splits into two opposing bulges, one where there's a lot of weight on negative scores, 
one where there's a lot of weight on positive scores and the negative score um, weight is larger. Again, She-Hulk just is almost all the way towards the negative scores. The bulge just really drops all the way to the bottom. So that's a sort of initial analysis of the score distributions for these two shows, but we can move a bit beyond that. So another interesting question is, and this really has to do with polarization, how many perfect or failing scores are assigned to each show? So I'm gonna define a perfect score as as many points as that group can assign. So for critics, this is 100 out of 100. For users, this is 10 out of 10. And so this is a pairwise um, bar chart here. So the left shows the amount of 100 out of 100s awarded by critic for critics for each show. The right shows the amount of 10 out of 10s awarded by users for each show. So as we might expect, critics are very stingy with how many perfect scores they're gonna give out. They all seem to agree though that WandaVision is the most deserving of the most perfect scores because it really towers above the other shows. And WandaVision actually has the most perfect scores from critics and users. Uh, personally, I can say that tracks. It was also my favorite show. And it seems like most people thought so as well. Um, other shows that are favored by users include Loki, Moon Knight and Miss Marvel. So these higher peaks over here, but in general, there's not too much interesting to look at here. It's just sort of an interesting question to wonder about. Now we can look at zero out of zeros, which is gonna be the same for each category. We don't see any zero out of zeros from critics. There are a lot of reasons this makes sense. They have a hundred degrees of freedom compared to 10. So they can find a better score than zero in most cases. And zero is essentially saying that this show has no value. And I'm sure critics will be able to find some value in everything, even if it's not what they prefer. A lot of zero out of zeros are awarded by users though. Uh, something I was surprised with is that there were actually a substantial amount of zero out of zeros awarded to WandaVision, even though it earned so many perfect scores um, above. So that's a bit surprising, but none of these really hold a candle to She-Hulk, the purple column over here, or Miss Marvel. They have the most uh, failing scores, zero out of zero. She-Hulk has almost three times as many as Miss Marvel. And so this tells us that there are a lot of people who really, really, really didn't like the show. The one thing interesting about looking about scores like zero out of zero is those scores potentially are better candidates for being review bomb scores than more medium scores like three, four, or five, because those tell us that the users who gave those reviews took some time to come up with that number. Um, if you really hate something, choosing zero is probably the easiest thing to do. Choosing a more medium number like three, four, or five, or six requires a little more thought and nuance. So looking at these does provide us with some sense of potentially these scores were review bombed, and that's why we're interested uh, in this data. Um, so before I sort of consolidate what we've learned so far, I just want to look at one more interesting thing. And this is, I think, my favorite chart to create from all this data. It was a bit complicated, but it shows how the percentage of bad, neutral, and good reviews for each show vary in time, where bad is um, the range of like one to three, neutral is like four to six, and good is seven to 10. And that's for users. It's the same thing for critics, just multiplied by 10. So basically how this works is on the left, there's a plot with the axis representing the total number of reviews and they're partitioned into blue for positive, yellow for neutral, red for negative. And then we have the same thing here, except it's just the total composition of all reviews. So it's a percentage plot where the top maximum value is one and everything has to add up to one. Uh, and I also added this little dash line here, which might be a bit hard to see, but it is the date where the last episode of the show was released. So some interesting things to note. For most shows, the blue category is the largest in the beginning, indicating that we have predominantly positive reviews at the very beginning where the show's first episode is released, and then negative and neutral reviews accrue over time. Also, you might be able to see that I've actually plotted the individual data points on these lines. So a significant fraction um, actually occur before the last episode was released, meaning that a lot of people posted their review without having watched all of the episodes so far. That means opinions might have changed. And also one show that one episode that was bad could have an outsized effect. Maybe a lot of people decided to give a review after that episode. And then perhaps the show actually improved in their point of view from there on. So this is a bit uh, fickle. It shows us that our data could be, have a uh, impact from a small thing, and maybe it's just over-exaggerated, and that's important to note as well. Um, we do see that, again, inconsistent with the other things we've seen, Miss Marvel and She-Hulk actually have predominantly negative reviews starting out. Uh, She-Hulk has almost essentially all negative reviews, and even now that its last episode has been released about last week, this is not showing any sign of decreasing. 
Um, whereas Ms. Marvel actually has a pretty respectable amount of positive and negative, again, pointing to the bimodality of its distribution. Uh, one also cool fact I noticed was that uh, the show Loki over here, uh, its last episode was released more than a year ago, but actually during the summer, there were quite a few reviews posted about it. And usually reviews tend to die off after about six months. So that was a bit interesting to see. Uh, okay, so I think I may be running a little short on time here, so I'll try to uh, go a little quicker. The two main observations we have from this data is that Miss Marvel is the most polarizing show among users and the least polarizing show among critics. All critics agree it is good. Users are split between it's good and it's bad. And also that critics like Miss Marvel much, much better than users on average and much, much better than other shows as average. So we have an inter and intra disagreement here, which makes it a somewhat compelling candidate for review bombing, but we want to collect a bit more data before we get to that conclusion. So I'm going to skim a bit through this because this is a avenue I went down that didn't yield much results. But one thing you might think about is if people are going to review bomb a show, maybe they'll leave a very short review because they want to uh, help promote quantity over quality in some sense. So let's look at review lengths. We can do that here where I plotted the length of reviews uh, as the stacked bar chart and colored by show. This is a bit difficult to make sense of though. So I actually like looking at this plot instead where we see, uh, for example, the light pink is zero to 100 word length reviews. The lighter orange is 101 to um, 199, et cetera, et cetera. And we see this broken down for each show. And what we notice is that these distributions are essentially the same across each show. Um, we'll notice that what if has a very large portion here. That's just because again, it has so few reviews. This is just noise. Uh, She-Hulk does have a substantial percentage of 100 word length reviews, and that is something interesting to note in terms of determining whether or not it was review bombed. But actually, after I did this whole analysis, I learned that you can just leave a score without even writing a review anyway. So in some sense, this isn't all too important. Uh, another thing I looked at is, is there any correlation between the length of review and a score? If the show is review bombed, we may expect a lot of negative or low scores to also have low lengths. We don't see any uh, correlation in this data. Again, these regression lines are kind of silly to even be here. It's just plotted for completeness in case there was correlation. <clears throat> Again, what if it's just noise? We can see how few data points it has compared to the other shows. So looking at length ultimately turned out to be somewhat of a dead end, but it was an interesting thing to consider. The thing that I found more interesting is <clears throat> how reviews themselves were reviewed. So Metacritic allows people to upvote or downvote reviews and the reviews with the most upvotes get pushed to the front. They're the first things people see. Downvoted reviews get pushed to the end. So they're the last thing people see. And what we see for most shows is that, and let me clarify this y-axis here is um, essentially how upvoted something was. So a one means all, it was completely upvoted. Zero means it was completely downvoted. And this is the actual score assigned by the user. So for most shows, we see that high scores by users are upvoted quite a bit. For example, scores that were tens for one division got upvoted quite a lot. They had few downvotes. And this is essentially a positive slope for our regression line. Again, this line doesn't completely fit the data. It's just there for completeness and to give you a sense that things are increasing as we increase our score. The last four shows actually do not follow this trend. <clears throat> I think for Hawkeye and Moon Knight, again, this is mostly somewhat just noise. We can see that they too have relatively few data points compared to the other shows. Uh, also the correlation um, R coefficient, R squared value is relatively weak. Ms. Marvel and She-Hulk though, do have a stronger correlation coefficient. Uh, She-Hulk in particular has an R squared of almost 0 0.6. So there is definitely a trend in this data. And what this means again to reiterate is low scores are being upvoted and high scores are being downvoted. Again, a possible candidate for review bombing behavior. Of course, some people may just be utilizing the functionality to do this. Um, but the interesting question is then why aren't people who are upvoting, who are writing positive reviews, upvoting positive reviews as well? Because it seems like people who are negatively voting are only making use of that downvote and upvote feature, not people who are writing positive reviews. And that's also something to consider. But I found this uh, pretty interesting actually to see in the data. Uh, so I think I'm basically almost out of time. I just want to quickly conclude. <clears throat> the third sort of observation we made is that there's not any really correlation between length and score or length of reviews across shows. The fourth observation is that Miss Marvel's reviews and she hulks reviews, positive reviews were aggressively downvoted. And this does not happen for most shows. Like I said, this may just be people taking 
advantage of the functionality to upvote or downvote. But that does raise the question of why didn't people who left positive reviews um, upvote positive reviews as well. So as an overall conclusion, I think the statistical evidence, it does not say for sure that Ms. Marvel was review bombed. We can't take into account things like user intent. And there are obviously a lot more complex things we could do to sort of figure out why people might be doing the things they're doing. I think what it does is it tells us that review bombing is not not happening. So it tells us that it could have happened. And that was originally what I set out to sort of answer, because like I mentioned, these uh, news articles were pasting some very murky, suspicious sort of statistical evidence for claiming it was certainly definitely review bombed. I think that the statistical evidence says that it was definitely possible that it was review bombed, but to sort of fully make that conclusion, we need certain non-statistical evidence. An example of non-statistical evidence in this case is something like Rotten Tomatoes, which had negative, uh, negative reviews for Ms. Marvel only three minutes after the show was actually released, predominantly negative reviews. That first episode was about 50 minutes. So that's not really a statistical piece of evidence, but that is another piece of evidence which would suggest review bombing. And the statistics seem to say that it is possible that it could have been review bombed. So it's important to be nuanced about that because we cannot fully make that conclusion. She-Hulk, um, this again, wasn't the main thing I set up to investigate, so I didn't spend as much time thinking about this. I think the fact that it has a substantial proportion of low length reviews is interesting. It does show the same aggressive downvoting behavior as well. Um, but the main thing is that there is no bimodality in its distribution. Critics and users both agree it's the worst show so far. So we don't have a very strong baseline or barometer um, from which to sort of determine everything from. It could have been review bombed. I'm again, not too, um, I'm not too up to date on any of the news articles or non-statistical pieces of evidence about this, but if it was, I don't think it would have been review bombed as much as Ms. Marvel was, given that it has this sort of polarization that She-Hulk doesn't. Uh, and yeah, so this was just a cool thing I attempted to do over the summer. Um, the cool thing about it is that you can do it with any other show, just put in the URL, uh, so any game or movie on Metacritic. Uh, I'm interested to see what the Rings of Power um, statistics will be now that it's just included, the first season is just concluded. Um, and if anyone would be interested uh, in sharing their thoughts or ideas on this, other statistical things you could look at to make it more robust, I'd love to hear your ideas. Um, this is just some contact information, my website link, which I wrote a short blog post on this, uh, and also my email. But that's essentially everything I wanted to share with you guys today. So thank you for taking the time to listen. Okay, thanks so much, Rohan. Well, I, we maybe have we have two minutes. Maybe we have time for one question or two questions that are both uh, asked quickly and answered quickly. Um, does anyone have a question? I can. I guess I can relay relay it to uh, to Rohan. Yeah, Rohan. So have you actually analyzed, say, the word choice that's used in the reviews mm -hmm. and looked for, say, common words or common phrases, especially in those <clears throat> negative, especially in those negative reviews? Yeah. So this is something I spent a little bit of time looking at so you can create word clouds that's basically as uh, technical as i did just looking at word clouds i didn't actually sort of plot the distributions of like bigrams or something like that um it tends to be very noisy for critics there's almost nothing you can get from those word clouds because the critic reviews are uh written very fancily i guess so there's very little overlap in words um for shows like miss marvel in particular just when i looked at one of the the main two main sorts of things were, and this is a reason people pointed to as it potentially being review bombed, is its diverse cast. So that's thing, one thing that popped up. One thing that also popped up um, was that it deviated a lot from the comics, and that seemed to be another thing that was popping up as a potential reason for uh, scores negative scores. So between those two things, those were the two main trends I see pop up in negative reviews. For positive reviews, it was just like generic, happy, positive language, um, nothing too descriptive as for giving a reason as to why. Uh, people reviewed it positively. All right. Well, thanks, Rohan.